speaker is Paul Fevler from the Satellite Application Catapult. Thanks very much. Hello everyone, well, my name is Paul Fevler. I'm from the Satellite Applications Catapult. My background is in telecommunications, although the Catapult deals with all the different types of services that satellites can deliver um, to try and improve the situation on a global basis and help industry grow. Um, so as I said, my background is in telecommunications. I started my career at British Telecom. And when I was there working at the research labs, one of the first projects I got involved in in the early 80s was a system for Inmarsat called Inmarsat C, which was essentially the first generation of digital communication systems that went over satellite for safety of life. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So we've heard about many of the applications, if you like, uh, of uh, the operations in, in, the, uh, in the maritime environment. Um, whether it be vessel efficiency, or deep sea mining, or, um, uh, or, or, or aquaculture. All of these uh, messages today have basically said we need to provide better connectivity to make them work. Um, we've all, have also heard about autonomy and taking people out of the, uh, the maritime environment for safety reasons. Um, here's, a, here's an autonomous vessel. It's one that you probably wouldn't want to be sitting on when it's actually in use because, of course, it's the, 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 uh, the, the platform on which um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the SpaceX's thrusters are, are returned to. So you definitely wouldn't want to be sitting on that when it comes back in, 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 and potentially misses the platform. So I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. Um, but basically, I think it's worth looking back over the history. When I started my career in BT, working on with satellites that really were kind of the first generation of satellites, and at that time, British Telecom employed 150 people in Portis Head over in Bristol, and they were the Morse code operators controlling all the shipping going in and out of UK water. <coughs> that was the way of communicating. BT closed that coastal radio station in 1999. That was 100 years of use of the same technology Marconi put in in 1899 for the first communication in the maritime sector. So the technology was there and used for a hundred years. And what displaced it was satellite communications, to provide over the horizons communications. And that first generation of technology enabled you to operate the kind of things that you'll still see today. This is a button here, yeah. Which is a dome, and inside there is a parabolic dish on a stabilized platform which could look at the various satellites. Of course, it needs to be stabilized in the maritime environment, because the ship's going all over the place. We'll come to that in a minute. But over the time, over the last few years, what we've had is the satellites have got bigger, and they've got more powerful, and the ability to deliver services to devices on your hand. So these are the kind of satellites. This is a picture of an InMarsat 4 satellite in construction. Um, that was back in the early 1990s, mid 1990s. Um, so that was the next generation of systems, really, that transformed the maritime economy to provide higher data rate services. And those satellites, I'm just going to touch a little bit on these things. They use frequency bands, which are very similar to the mobile frequency bands, and they're a very tiny slice of spectrum. Very much in demand, that spectrum, for, for essentially delivering services uh, for, for us and society as a whole. The other frequency bands, I'll just highlight them. This block here is a KU band satellite, 12 and 14 gigahertz, is used for satellite TV. So those frequency bands are used for broadcast services, typically increasingly used for communication. And the very interesting bigger block of spectrum up at the 20 and 30 gigahertz frequency. And we're going beyond that. And the reason you can see that we're going there is there's much more space in the spectrum for <coughs> delivering higher bandwidth services, so sort of things that are required to make some of these applications work. So towards the end of the 2010s, we started to see commercial satellites being created that exploit these frequency bands, the KA frequency bands, that's an Inmarsat 5 satellite, they still look like that, different sizes, but essentially a stabilised VSAT, um, uh, a very small aperture terminal. When we say very small aperture, they can be anything from the size of a football to the size of half of this room. Um, I just wanted to touch a little bit on orbits because this is some of the innovations that are taking place now and that's going to really make a change to the sector. So just here on the left you can see two scale, the Earth and a geostationary satellite. And you can see there's a few satellites, and with those few satellites, you can illuminate just about all the planet, not the poles. Um, the critical thing here is, think about the Earth radius, <laughs> 6,000 kilometers, 
<coughs> these satellites are 36,000 kilometers above the equator, about 40,000 kilometers from here. So to get the signal up to the satellite and back is 80,000 kilometers, and if you want to talk to someone, you have to go up and down twice, so it's uh, 160,000 kilometers. Speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second, it's about half a second. So when you hear about latency, not much you can do about it because that's how long it takes the satellite, the signal to get to the satellite and back. And it's an awful long way away. Typically a mobile phone um, transmits, um, it's something in the real order of 100 milliwatts, a bit less than an LED torch. You wouldn't want it to be much hotter than that if you put it next to your ear. That signal is traveling 40,000 kilometers. It's flashing on and off 150,000 or 200,000 times per second at different degrees of intensity, and provide the satellite and put that down again. The amplification on the satellite, in engineering terms, 200 decibels. That's 100 million, million, million times amplification. A tiny little signal that is somewhere on the planet. So this is the kind of technologies that we deal with every day. Now back in the, um, the late 90s, there was a big wave of investment in low Earth orbit satellite communications. Here's an illustration of the Iridium constellation. It was one of a number of constellations that was going to enable global business traveler to communicate wherever they were in the world. And then we had GSM. So that kind of made sure that you could connect everywhere. And I wanted, at the time, there, were, there was a wave of investment in the late 90s on providing communications to satellite phones, similar to this. This is the Iridium phone, that's a global star phone. Um, and they look very much similar to the to the original mobile phones that were that were shown in these original pictures. Actually, my phone's bigger than your phone. Something to be proud of in those days. And we're getting back there right now. Um, so, one of the considerations here is I've the reason I've shown you those two constellations on the left is Global Star, and on the right is Iridium. And the bottom left-hand side there is a coverage map for Global Star. And you can see that it doesn't cover much of the ocean. And the reason it doesn't is you can't put a base station in the middle of the ocean, not very easily. So the services are delivered up to the satellite and back down to the ground to a ground station. So it's not a global service which serves the maritime industry. Iridium, however, uses inter-satellite links. So you go up to the satellite, it hops around the satellite constellation and then down into a gateway. So it's a global service. So both Iridium and Inmarsat offer safety of life services off their communication platform. And they have saved literally thousands of lives in the last 20 years. So just some context. In Mossad C, I was working on the late 80s, became real in about, well, we were doing the testing in, in 89 for the Oprah version, so 30 years ago. Still in service today. So the reading in Mossad, around 30 years, providing voice and talents. Okay. So in the the sort of 2000 era to 2010, there was uh, the investment of these new projects to provide um, services, data services, first generation data services. We're now seeing another wave. And the wave of investment in the satellite technology today, I'm going to touch on and spend a little bit of time on this, um, is being driven by the demand for data connectivity. And the data connectivity that's being provided is designed to be provided to services on vehicles or for backhaul of 4G and 5G base stations, where it's very difficult to provide that connectivity through the investment in infrastructure that's required for the terrestrial networks. So wherever you go on the land, you're likely to be going in some <coughs> vehicle. So the investment in technology that provides the vehicle as a communications hub is what's driving some of the investment in these new constellations. So you'll see, I've highlighted a couple of them here. Uh, so we've got high throughput satellites, very large satellites that are going to geostationary, and some of the um, interesting, what we call mega constellations. And I'm gonna focus on a couple of these. So Telesat, um, you can see the kind of uh, anticipated launch, 2021, um, 117 satellites. The, it's in orbit, one of the sat test satellites, and it was tested by, sorry, sat, um, by, uh, the um, 5GRC center in Surrey, the latency over this system provide essentially 100 megabits per second plus capability for 5G connectivity, and it was better than 40 milliseconds. So that's giving you the sense of now the latency is a little bit under control. Um, but what's interesting you now, we've got a couple, we've got competition just like we did in the in the 1990s to get to be the first constellation in orbit. 
at any significant capacity. So we have uh, one in the UK um, that is uh, the one web, and we've also got uh, something we're going to talk a little bit about in a moment, SpaceX, and we'll see why um, the Starlink have been described. But first of all, Inmarsat is not stopping uh, investing either. So you have a number of these KA band satellites providing multi megabits, 100 megabits type capability to vessels. Um, and what's interesting now is you can see this additional constellation. Oops, sorry. This constellation. This is a highly elliptical <coughs> orbit. So at the peak of the orbit here, this is actually higher than geostationary. So it's not going to solve the latency issue. But the real reason for developing these technologies or deploying satellites into these technologies, as you can see, that they cover the polar regions. <coughs> so geostationary satellites, the horizon for a geostationary satellite <coughs> is about 78 degrees north, something like that. Above that, there isn't any coverage, unless you happen to be an aeroplane, you can go a bit further. <coughs> they cover the entire poles. So the investment in this technology is to provide great circle coverage, for the aviation sector, where there's an uptick in investment and because of the need for connecting passengers, providing safety, but also because the Arctic Circle is opening up from a maritime perspective. And there's a realization that if you say you are a global service provider, you better make sure you cover the whole planet. So the highly elliptical orbit, this is a GX class of satellite, so it's running on the higher frequency bands. It requires at the moment one of these of dishes that's about one meter, 0.7 to one meter uh, aperture terminal. <coughs> um, but it will provide complete coverage, it doesn't cover the south poles of course, but complete coverage of the planet including the, the north poles. So that's really interesting, it's significant investment, it's done in conjunction with Norway um, and really starting to open up access for the maritime environment to the whole planet. There are some other markets as well. So SES has a MEO constellation, a medium Earth orbit. So this is not very close to the planet, with a 800 kilometer, 1,000 Earth, but that's <coughs> probably a sort of 8,000 kilometer range. So what you've got here, you can see these satellites, they're in an equatorial orbit. So they go around the equator. And of course, because they're not up at 36,000 kilometers, they process around the planet. They don't take 24 hours <coughs> around the planet, they take some time less, you know, essentially half a day. So, as you can see the satellites here, they're set up as a, as a lot of dishes. And that means that you can create spot beams that you can link together. So this is really targeted at where there's very hot spots of technology, uh, of connectivity requirement. So it might be an island, it might be an oil uh, operation center, it might be a mining center in the middle of the Pacific, and connecting it single hot to somewhere a quarter of the way around the planet. So this is really interesting for some of those deep ocean type of connectivity platforms because these are very high capacity satellites in terms of the, the links, the data links in that area provides that kind of performance. But of course, it is in the equatorial plane and because it's lower than geostationary orbit, it actually doesn't even come quite up to the UK. You can just about see it in the UK. So initial um, block of, of satellites, were there were eight satellites, there were 16, um, but interestingly now, SES is also proposing putting this class of satellites into a non-equatorial orbit, into essentially a, an inclined orbit that gives coverage out to those very interesting areas. It's all commercial investment for the purpose of providing connectivity for some of these new applications that we've been talking about today, essentially autonomous vessels or operations in those high latitude environments. So this is significant investment because there's a need. So I'm going to come back to the mega constellations now again. So I mentioned OneWeb, they're just down the road here in, um, in London. Um, significant investment. The number of satellites now is starting to get really interesting. 648 satellites. Now there's been a number of different uh, modifications to this number because you can play with the economics and you can get about a pretty good coverage with anything from 600, 700, 800 satellites. So this is the number of satellites that are being launched. You can see that 145 kilograms. So the, the seven, eight ton behemoths that are being put into geostationary orbit, the advantage now is you can put a large number of satellites onto a single launch and launch one plane of your constellation, all in one go. So it brings economies of scale. 
This is being driven from the advances in manufacturing. It's kind of taking the automotive <coughs> sector mentality. Build it, build it fast and build it cheap and get a lot of it in place. So over the next, the, the first orbit, the first six satellites were launched, as you can see there, I think it says uh, February this year. So those satellites are to test the system and the rest of them will be launched over the next year. By 2021, the Constellation will be in service. <coughs> now what changes now, and this is really important, is that the satellites are no longer on the horizon or 20 degrees off the horizon from here if your geostationary satellites about 20 degrees from the horizon but they're going to be just above you they're going to be there's always going to be satellite above you that means the energy is going to go down through the urban canyons it will go down and through the forest can canopies directly onto the antennas and that what that does is it brings up the opportunity to move away from a parabolic dish steering and tracking these satellites to a flat lens <coughs> antenna on the top of the vehicle. So it's invisible to the human eye. The efficiency is still good because it's a good collecting area for the energy coming 20 degrees from the normal. It's a massive investment now in the antennas that will work with these systems. There are four major players globally, three of them are in the UK that are developing the technologies that are going to use these constellations and be integrated into vehicles. Now, why is that interesting for the maritime sector? Well, there are flat surfaces on a vessel too, so you can deploy it on a vessel. And some of the technologies here, they have to be engineered to hit the price points that are going to be sensitive, useful for these systems to operate. And really, why should it be £20,000 for a terminal? It's only the economies of scale, really, that means that that technology costs that much. If you're going to produce millions of devices, you will be down into the price points of these things. So that's what's driving the change investment. Now, we have a slight challenge here, because remember I showed you the global stock picture? The OneWeb constellation does not have intersatellite links, at least the first generation. So from a maritime perspective, useful for coastal areas, it will certainly be suitable for, for the littoral zone because you'll be able to reach the base station, but not for the deep ocean. Starlink, though, is another story. Look at the number of satellites we're talking about now. 1,584 for the first constellation of bigger, slightly bigger satellites, the first ones are 286. There's some, some differences here depending upon whether it's you, you, you include fuel and different <coughs> This is the launch configuration. 60 satellites in one. The first satellite was, were launched in May, and last Monday, I had to wait to update my slides, I wasn't going to give them the information yesterday, because last Monday, last week, the second launch went up. And this is a picture from the launch vehicle. It looks like something out of iRobot, or Tron. But these satellites will be everywhere. Now, they're already raising controversy with regard to astron astronomical uh, activities because there's a lot of them, or there will be a lot of them, and they will affect observations. Um, however, from the perspective of providing services to this community, I think it brings a great opportunities for seeing some of the things that we've, we've envisioned today actually come to life. Here's an artistic rendition. You can see every single satellite operator, whenever they do an artistic rendition of the satellites, it never points to where it's supposed to be pointing. Um, it needs to be pointing at the planet, which is what the other ones are doing, um, providing services. Um, even in Moss, I'm guilty of that when I was there. When I was there. But, um, so these are flat plate antennas on the satellite, different frequency bands. These are at K, A frequency bands, so the high frequency bands. Um, but also, um, Starlink is looking at SpaceX at higher frequency bands, V uh, band, which is even higher, it's 40 to, to 70 gigahertz, so it'll be somewhere in that territory. Um, at very low altitude, below the ISS, 200 kilometer type altitudes. They don't stay in place very long, um, but the idea is you encourage them. So the investment in these constellations is significant, but if you put it in the context of the investment in terrestrial connectivity, it's a very small number, even 10 billion. The cost of deploying 5G across the whole of the UK to provide 50 megabits per second everywhere is estimated as somewhere between 60 and 70 billion pounds over the lifetime of the system. It's astonishingly expensive. If you've got a 10 billion pound constellation and you're going to get a certain amount of revenue, you can offset the investment cost for the deployment of a terrestrial network so it comes down from 70 billion to 20 billion, there's a massive incentive. 
but it does require the devices to be useful. These are designed to provide services to flat plate antennas, perhaps on the top of a vessel, perhaps on the top of a vehicle, where that becomes your connectivity hub. You connect to the vehicle, the vehicle connects to the satellite, and the satellite connects to the vehicle. So this is the kind of model. So I just want to give you a sense of the things that are happening now. These are going up now. They are going to make a massive difference in terms of enabling some of the things that we've heard about today. Perhaps it will be a reality in very few years to come. Thank you.